Welcome back to the course, Seeking Jesus. My name is John Hilton. Today's class is called Jesus Christ and the Restoration. There's a large time gap between our class today and our previous class, where we were primarily studying scripture written between 70 and 100 AD. During this 1700 year gap, Christianity went from being a small offshoot of Judaism to being the largest religion in the world. The story of how that happens is beyond the scope of this course, and it's too much to summarize. So we're just going to skip 1,700 years of history and go straight to a 14-year-old boy named Joseph Smith, who is wondering about his life, his status before God, and which church he should join. In this image, Joseph Smith is reading James 1.5, pondering, reflecting on it again and again. But what if this image were replaced by this? Would we have missed the restoration if a 14-year-old boy got distracted by a phone notification? What do we need to do in order to ponder and reflect more on the scriptures? Well, because of Joseph Smith's pondering, he went to a private place, knelt down, and prayed vocally. In his own words, he said, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved Son. Hear Him. From the first vision, we learn a lot about Jesus Christ that perhaps some of us take for granted. For example, we learn the fact that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are two distinct individuals. We also have a witness in the modern era that Jesus Christ truly was resurrected and has a body of flesh and bones. If the first vision were Joseph Smith's only contribution to our knowledge about Jesus Christ, it would by itself be an incredible gift. But it's not Joseph's only contribution and not the only time he saw the Savior. For example, in Hiram, Ohio, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon had a vision. They wrote, We saw him even on the right hand of God, and we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him and through him and of him the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. Later, When the Kirtland Temple was dedicated, Jesus appeared and said, I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. I mentioned these multiple visions to emphasize that gaining or strengthening our testimony of Joseph Smith helps us better know Jesus Christ. Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf taught, Through our faith in the personal witness of the prophet Joseph and the reality of the first vision, we will be blessed with a firm faith in the Savior of the world. In other words, a testimony of Joseph Smith strengthens our testimony of Jesus Christ. We've all done different things to gain or strengthen our testimony of the prophet Joseph. Several years ago, Elder Neil L. Anderson gave an invitation that has helped many people. He said, I give a specific challenge. Gain a personal witness of the prophet Joseph Smith. Consider recording the testimony of Joseph Smith in your own voice, listening to it regularly and sharing it with friends. Listening to the prophet's testimony in your own voice will help bring the witness you seek. Have you tried taking this invitation? A few years before Elder Anderson gave this talk, I was teaching seminary, and we were going to be studying the Doctrine and Covenants and church history the following year. I thought it would be fun to, during the first week of class, dress up like Joseph Smith and tell the students the Joseph Smith story in first person as though I were him. But to do that, I needed to memorize his words. I got an ancient device called a cassette recorder and recorded myself saying Joseph Smith's history. During my daily commute, I listened to myself reciting these words. It took some time, but I was able to act like Joseph Smith on that first day of class. I don't know, maybe my seminary students thought it was the worst day of seminary, but I really felt the spirit while listening to Joseph Smith's words and letting them sink into my heart. I'm not saying you need to memorize all of Joseph Smith's history, but if you haven't yet taken Elder Anderson's invitation to record Joseph Smith's testimony with your own voice, it's not too late. I found that Elder Anderson's promise was true. Listening to the prophet Joseph's testimony in my own voice helped me and it will help you deepen your witness of Joseph Smith and Jesus Christ. In modern times, Jesus Christ has taught about many important topics. Today, we'll look at four. First, let's explore a series of passages that focus on what the Savior has said about prophets and the church. First, from Doctrine and Covenants, section 1. I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments, and also those to whom these commandments were given, 
might have power to lay the foundation of this church and to bring it forth out of obscurity and out of darkness, the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth, with which I, the Lord, am well pleased, speaking unto the church collectively and not individually. Here, in the preface to the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord emphasizes both the importance of the prophet and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. On April 6, 1830, the church was organized, and on this day there was one revelation given. It's Doctrine and Covenants, section 21. And in this revelation, there's only one commandment. In other words, on the day the church was organized, one commandment was given. It's, Wherefore, meaning the church, thou shalt give heed unto all the prophet Joseph Smith's words and commandments, which he shall give unto you, as he receiveth them, walking in all holiness before me. For his word ye shall receive as if from mine own mouth in all patience and faith. Note the promises that come from following the prophet. For by doing these things, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yea, and the Lord God will disperse the powers of darkness from before you and cause the heavens to shake for your good and his name's glory. Jesus Christ really wants us to follow the prophet. Consider additional passages about the church. The Lord has said, It is your duty to unite with the true church. Ye shall remember the church articles and covenants to keep them. A revelation of Jesus Christ, yea, the word of the Lord concerning his church, established in the last days for the restoration of his people. The priesthood continueth in the church of God in all generations. Think about this pattern. Over and over, Jesus Christ in the modern day emphasizes the importance of prophets in his church. Sometimes we hear people say something like, well, I want to be spiritual but not religious, or I just focus on my personal relationship with God. I don't really need a church. Those ideas just aren't in harmony with Christ's repeated teachings. In addition, it's helpful to remember that we focus on the church and living prophets not because they're entities unto themselves, but because prophets and the church point us to Jesus Christ. Today, we're blessed to have 15 prophets, seers, and revelators who are special witnesses of Jesus Christ. Learning from them is a powerful way for us to come into Christ. The Savior himself has proclaimed the importance of the church by saying, you need to unite yourself with my church. President Dallin H. Oaks explained, We, of course, affirm that the scriptures, ancient and modern, clearly teach the origin and need for a church directed by and with the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. We also testify that the restored Church of Jesus Christ has been established to teach the fullness of His doctrine and to officiate with His priesthood authority to perform the ordinances necessary to enter the kingdom of God. President Nelson taught this principle in a memorable way. He said, we cannot wish our way into the presence of God. We are to obey the laws upon which that blessing is predicated. One of those laws is to worship in church each Sabbath day. Despite the good works that can be accomplished without a church, the fullness of doctrine and its saving and exalting ordinances are available only in the restored church. I hope we'll remember the teachings of Jesus Christ about his church and the importance of prophets. Let's turn to a second topic, regret. No matter how great a life you've lived, you probably have some regrets. Let's discuss for a moment a 22-year-old and something he regretted. His name was Joseph Smith. When Joseph was 22 years old, he had translated 116 pages of the Book of Mormon. He prayed about whether he should give Martin Harris the translated manuscript and felt he should not do it. But Joseph was young, and under incredible pressure, he eventually gave Martin the 116 pages, which were then lost. In some respects, this was an irreversibly bad decision. The 116 pages were never recovered. You, me, every church member, we all wish we had these pages. After losing the pages, Joseph was distraught and exclaimed, All is lost. On the other hand, Joseph's choice to give Martin the manuscript has not done long-term damage. God anticipated this would happen and prepared an alternate solution through the small plates of Nephi. The Book of Mormon as we have it is a marvelous book, and in his later life, Joseph rarely, if ever, mentioned this incident. Put in the context of his entire life, the lost 116 pages were not that big of a deal. All of us do things we regret. 
Joseph's poor decision at age 22 did not define his life and the choices we make in our early 20s or at any other time need not define ours. After Joseph lost the 116 pages, the Lord said to him, Thou art still chosen and art again called to the work. And he encouraged Joseph to be faithful and continue on. These words apply to you and me. Regardless of our regrets, we can be faithful and continue on. Yes, if we had known in the past what we know now, we could have made better decisions. But even so, we are still chosen by God and we can press forward. When you feel regret for choices you've made, gently remind yourself that everybody does things he or she regrets. In the context of your entire life, any one mistake does not define you. And remember, God is calling you to be faithful and continue on. Another principle I want to highlight from Jesus and the Doctrine and Covenants has to do with our worth. When I was a kid, I had a great investing idea. I decided to put my money into football cards. I thought they would dramatically increase in value and that by the time I was in my 40s, they would be worth about a million dollars. Unfortunately, today they're not worth very much. The reason why my football cards aren't worth very much is because very few people are interested in buying them. Something is only worth what another person will pay for it. Think about that in terms of what Christ paid for you. In Doctrine and Covenants section 18 verse 10, we find a famous verse you might have memorized. It says, remember, the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. Do you know the very next phrase? In the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, what we have today is verses 10 and 11. We're part of the same verse and they express one continuous thought. Remember, the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. For behold, meaning look and see, the Lord your Redeemer suffered death in the flesh, that all might repent and come unto him. It's powerful to see the Lord define our worth in terms of his atoning sacrifice. Jesus gave up his life. That is the worth of a soul. When this truth sinks deep in our hearts, it brings great strength to our lives. Even when things are going bad, even if we don't feel like we're worth very much, we can remember, Jesus Christ died for you. He died for me. That says something important about our worth. A fourth lesson we can learn from Jesus Christ in the latter days concerns his messages about angels. The Lord has declared, I have given the heavenly hosts and mine angels charge concerning you. Mine angels shall go up before you, and mine angels are round about you to bear you up. The influence of angels is real. President James E. Faust taught, we do not consciously realize the extent to which ministering angels affect our lives. Their ministry has been and is an important part of the gospel. Who are these angels? Many of them are our own ancestors. President Joseph F. Smith wrote, When messengers are sent to minister to the inhabitants of this earth, they are not strangers, but from the ranks of our kindred, friends, and fellow beings and fellow servants. President Joseph F. Smith also taught our fathers and mothers, brothers, sisters, and friends may have a mission given them to visit their relatives and friends upon the earth. The idea that our ancestors are our ministering angels fits with Christ's teachings. He said, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. We commonly teach that the turning of the hearts of the children to the fathers connects with family history and temple work. For those of us alive today, our hearts are turned to our fathers or our ancestors, and we search after them to perform work for them that they can't do for themselves. But notice that before talking about the hearts of the children turning to the fathers, Jesus speaks of the hearts of the fathers turning to the children. I believe that the hearts of our fathers or our ancestors are turned toward us and they search us out to perform work that we cannot do for ourselves. Let's combine the idea that our ancestors are among the angels watching over us with the statement from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, who taught that when facing difficult circumstances, we should pray without ceasing, ask for angels to help you. Adding, we should pray for angels to help us to our ancestors are among those angels who are ministering to us equals we can find great power in praying for our ancestors to help us. I'm not saying we should pray to our ancestors. Rather, we can pray to Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ and ask for our ancestors to help us with specific challenges we face. I know the principle of praying for help from our ancestors works. A few years ago, my wife Lonnie and I experienced a very serious challenge. 
it seemed as if a righteous desire we had both worked diligently to achieve was about to shatter into a million pieces. We felt constant darkness, and in despair we pled with God, naming specific ancestors who we thought would particularly be concerned about the situation, and asking God to send those ancestors, those angels, to help intervene. As we prayed multiple times over an extended period, we felt the support of these unseen beings and could feel of their love and interest. Miracles occurred that we can only attribute to divine intervention, help that we believe came through the direct assistance of ancestors. Angels are real, and our ancestors are among those angels. Just as we help our ancestors with divinely appointed tasks they cannot do for themselves, they are able to perform divinely appointed tasks that we cannot do for ourselves. Now, thus far, we've talked about four lessons we can learn from Christ's teachings in the modern day. Because the Savior has revealed so much in the past 200 years, we could easily have an entire course just focused on Jesus Christ and the Restoration. When I originally came up with the Seeking Jesus course, my idea was to make 28 videos because that's about the same length as an institute or college religion class. In the future, I hope to invite guest speakers to come and share additional insights on Seeking Jesus. But with this video, the original 28 class series comes to an end. As this course comes to a close, I want to thank you for the effort that you've put into it. You've invested a significant amount of time into watching these videos, and I'm grateful to you. Recently, an individual who had watched all these classes wrote me the following. This course has opened my eyes to how much I don't know about Christ. I'm not saying I don't know anything, but I've realized that his life and teachings are beyond anyone's ability to study in a lifetime. So having new ideas and topics to explore gets me genuinely excited about a lifetime of coming closer to Christ and broadening my understanding of him. I was so happy when I read this because it was exactly the outcome I was hoping for. I hope that this course has broadened your horizons and gotten you excited to continue learning all you can about Jesus Christ. You might consider re-watching this video series with friends or family members and discussing what you learn. If you haven't already used all the materials associated with the course, you might want to check out the link in the description and explore more of the available free resources. And as you continue to learn new things about the Savior, I hope you'll consider sharing what you learn with me. Many of the things I've shared in this class I found because someone like you shared them with me. And I welcome your ideas and insights on how to draw closer to Jesus Christ. I want to take the final few minutes of this video to step back and reflect on this course as a whole. Over these 28 videos, we've covered topics like Jesus and parables, the Savior's miracles, and Jesus Christ and fence laws. We've had these classes one at a time, but to me, this course is more than a collection of individual videos. Hopefully, there's a holistic value in the time we spent together in this course. Ultimately, no matter how good or bad these videos have been, they will only be useful if you and I do something because of them. And I hope that one of the things we do is to consciously find more ways to seek Jesus. Remember what President Nelson taught. As we invest time in learning about the Savior and His atoning sacrifice, we are drawn to Him. As we seek to be disciples of Jesus Christ, our efforts to hear Him need to be ever more intentional. It takes conscious and consistent effort to fill our daily lives with His words, His teachings, His truths. There are so many ways we can learn about Jesus Christ. Take a moment right now and consider this question. What do you feel prompted to do to continue to learn more about Jesus Christ and come closer to Him? There's no one right answer to this question. I'm going to share a series of ideas, and I'm not saying that you need to do any or all of them. Each of our circumstances are unique. What I am suggesting is that we each need to be conscious and deliberate in our efforts to learn all we can about Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about adding one more thing to your already busy day. I'm talking about creating joyful spaces that help us connect with Christ. As you listen to these ideas, is there one that gets you excited? One of my favorite ways to come closer to Christ is to take President Nelson's invitation to read every verse about Jesus Christ in the topical guide. When you read the scriptures, it can be easy to focus on the storyline or other details. But when you're reading the topical guide verses on Jesus Christ, comma, advocate, and you read verse after verse about how Jesus is our advocate, that insight sinks in a little bit deeper. There are several print and online resources that make it easier to take this invitation. See the link in the description for more details about this and the other ideas I'm about to share. Another approach to learning all we can about Jesus Christ is to pick a topic related to the Savior and do an in-depth study of it. 
For example, recently I've been studying the miracles Christ performed in the New Testament. As I've read these accounts slowly and carefully, I found several details that I might have otherwise missed. We could do this kind of summary with Christ's parables, his questions, his sermons, his commandments, his name, his atonement. There is so much to learn. Because there's so much to learn, it's great to have variety in our studies. If you find yourself getting bored of one area of learning about Jesus, no problem. Switch to a different approach. Maybe in a few days, you'll be ready to come back to your original focus. One method I love is the synopsis study. We've talked about this in previous classes. It's where you carefully study the similarities and differences of major events in the gospel accounts of the Savior's life, such as his baptism, suffering in Gethsemane, crucifixion, resurrection, and so forth. Synopsis studies facilitate careful scripture reading, and careful scripture reading facilitates new understandings and deeper connections with Christ. Another way we can seek Jesus is through books. Whether you prefer to read or listen to them, there are dozens of books that can help you deepen your understanding of Jesus Christ. We can learn from scholars both inside and outside of the church, as well as faithful Christians of all denominations. If you're thinking, wow, synopsis study, reading books, this sounds like a lot of work. Couldn't I just watch a movie instead? Of course. That's a great way to focus on the Savior. Another simple idea is to write down your testimony of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, one of my students tried to find her ancestors' testimonies of Jesus Christ. She was surprised and a little bit saddened because she could find her ancestors' testimony of principles like tithing or the word of wisdom, but not specifically Jesus Christ. The ancestor just hadn't written it down. One day, you will be the ancestor. Will your descendants be able to find your testimony of Jesus Christ? There are so many other approaches to focusing our studies on Christ. You could memorize the living Christ, look up general conference talks or BYU devotionals that focus on the Savior, or read any book of Scripture with a focus on Jesus. We can also seek Jesus through artwork, music, and a host of other ways. If you've heard all these ideas as a list of things you should feel guilty for not doing, then I said it wrong. I'm talking about finding joy in Jesus. I don't want anyone to be overwhelmed, feeling like, I just don't have time to do all these things. I'm simply suggesting, let's be conscious and deliberate. You're going to spend some amount of study time for the rest of your life. How could we focus those efforts on Jesus Christ? Take 30 seconds and start this process. Jot down a response to this question. What will you do in your life moving forward to learn more about Jesus Christ and come closer to Him? There are so many things we could do. Perhaps we want to focus on making our holiday celebrations more Christ-centered, either by making changes or additions to our current traditions, or even by celebrating religious holidays that we don't currently do a lot with, like Good Friday or Pentecost. Maybe we want to memorize passages about Jesus Christ or change the way we partake of the sacrament. Whatever we decide, let's be deliberate in our efforts to learn all we can about Jesus Christ. As we conclude, I want to touch on two titles of Christ. There are more than 100 titles for the Savior, each of which provides insight into His life and ministry. Let me introduce the first title by acknowledging that we live in a world filled with anxiety and worry. While it may seem like our struggles are new, we are in fact not alone. Consider this scriptural pattern. Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, was greatly afraid and distressed. Helaman was filled with fear. Ammon and his brothers were depressed in their hearts. Nephite soldiers were depressed in body as well as in spirit. Lehi spoke of the anxiety of his soul. His son Jacob experienced over-anxiety, and Alma felt great anxiety even unto pain, being troubled in his spirit because of the poor choices of others. Chief Judge Pahoran was worried about the political conditions of his day, and Coriantum was worried about the doctrine of the church. Fear, depression, anxiety, worry— you've almost certainly experienced similar feelings as have I. Although these feelings are real, it's significant that each of the individuals I just named found hope and comfort by focusing on Jesus Christ. He brings peace. In fact, Abinadi called Jesus the founder of peace. What does that mean, that Jesus is the founder of peace? In Joseph Smith's day, a contemporary dictionary described the word founder as one that founds, establishes, and erects one that lays a foundation. A secondary definition is one who endows, one who furnishes a permanent fund for the support of an institution, as in the founder of a college or hospital. 
Considering these definitions helps us see that the Savior's atonement lays a solid foundation for peace. Because of his sacrifice, no mortal sorrow or concern will be permanent. Christ offers an infinite endowment that provides more than enough support for us to have everlasting peace. When angels announced the birth of Christ, they proclaimed, On earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross. And the first words that the resurrected Lord said to his apostles were, Peace be unto you. From the beginning to the end and everywhere in between, peace is a core message from our Savior. When you face challenging times, remember this title. Jesus is the founder of peace. The second title I want to discuss isn't mentioned very often, perhaps because it appears in Isaiah. It's also in Isaiah 22, which is not one of the Isaiah chapters found in the Book of Mormon, making it even less likely that we'll come across it. But Elder Jeffrey R. Holland called this chapter a moving messianic tribute. It's a lesser-known story about two men named Shebna and Eliakim. Shebna was an official in King Hezekiah's court, but he did something bad and was kicked out. His replacement was a man named Eliakim, and Eliakim is a type of Christ. In Isaiah 22, we learn that Eliakim received the key of the house of David. Speaking of Eliakim, it says, He shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. In the book of Revelation, Jesus identifies himself as having the key of David and says, He's the one that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Can you see how there's a clear correspondence between Jesus and Eliakim? Jesus himself makes that connection. Why does this matter? Notice what the Lord says about Eliakim. I will fasten Eliakim as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house, and they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off. In its original context, this passage tells us that Eliakim was a key part of Hezekiah's royal court. Imagine a nail or a peg in a wall with all sorts of important things hanging on that peg. That's Eliakim. We can see Jesus Christ in that same way. We as individuals and the gospel as a whole hang on him. Of course, the phrase nail in the sure place has another connotation. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said, When the Roman soldiers drove their four and one half inch crucifixion spikes into their victim's flesh, they did so first in the open palm. But because the weight of the body might tear that flesh and not sustain the burden to be carried, they also drove nails into the wrist, down in the nexus of bones and sinews that would not tear no matter what the weight. Thus, the nail in the wrist was the nail in a sure place. Once it was removed and the Savior was cut down, the burden of the crucified body, more literally the burden of the atonement, was brought to an end. In terms of our salvation, Christ is the nail in a sure place, never failing, never faltering. For each of us, this phrase might have different meanings. For me, it means that Christ is always there. He is rock solid. We can build our lives on Him. I know Jesus Christ lives. In my life, the more I've been able to make Him my foundation, the happier I've been. I know that He lives, He loves and cares for me and for you, and He will strengthen and bless each of us. You and I will never regret time we invest to draw closer to Him. He is the nail in a sure place. Thanks for staying until the very end. I want to make sure that you know there are pre-class readings for each of these videos in the course, as well as additional resources like PowerPoints and quiz questions to explore. Click the link in the description to access these additional learning resources.